I, I think I, I really try to study up on psychoacoustics and, and what's known, what experiments people have done. And there is, a, I think, a key piece here is that in our mind, we are able to uh, uh, segregate the sound as it occurs in time into different streams. And to give you an example here, if I had a conversation with, with my wife here in front and you were all chatting, well, this may be a little bit crowded there, but let's see, there were three or four people also talking. Uh, this, by the way, what I'm talking about is, is called the cocktail party effect there. Uh, we can talk to each other even when all these people around us are talking, having a conversation. But not only that, while we are talking, I could tune into the conversation that is going on over there. Okay, Picking up enough pieces to put together a stream of sounds there that makes sense. Now this is, this is a cognitive process, it's something that happens in our brain there. Very difficult to do with a computer to, to uh, sort out the thing. People with hearing aids have great difficulty doing that type of thing. Uh, it's a stream segregation and we use cues due to the onset of, of sounds, the timbre, pretty much all the characteristics, duration of sounds, loudness, directions. We have the ability to change our acoustic horizon. It is variable. And I'm sure you have experienced that, that you can, you can be concentrated on something and not hear what's going on around you. But you can also switch, switch it off and then focus on something else. In other words, you can, the distance of your acoustic horizon is variable. And if you, if you haven't seen uh, these references, these three references, I, give you, I think they make fascinating reading. I'm reading right now this book here. This is Your Brain on Music by Daniel Levitin. Uh, I heard him speak a few weeks ago in New York at the AS convention. It was absolutely fascinating. Uh, he does, uh, he is at McGill University in Canada and does a lot of uh, research, brain research there on, on what happens in the brain, which parts are active or so. And he had wonderful examples there. And, and the book, I think, is absolutely fascinating. There's also a book that came out this year by Barry Blesser and uh, Linda Roos Salter, I think is the first name, came out this year, Spaces Speak, Are You Listening?, which deals with the whole issue of space, room, and uh, how we deal with it, not just uh, today, but historically in different cultures, how we listen to spaces. And uh, the stream analysis concept, I don't know if Bregman was the one who introduced it first there, but, but his book, uh, I recommend read the introduction. I think you get enough of it. It gets very deep in there, so I never got beyond the introductory chapter there, but I think I sort of got the gist of the whole thing. Now, uh, all of this... I think relates back to the evolution of our, of our hearing, the evolution of spatial hearing in life, in life forms, not just in humans, but in animals as well. Hearing is a very important mechanism for survival. For survival, you, if there is a threat to survival, you want to know from where is it coming and how far away is it. How much time do I have to run or hide or whatever, right? So direction and distance are very important. So we are highly attuned to those cues that tell us direction and distance there. And more than that, we have to be able to pick out those cues under very different conditions, like whether it's out in the open savanna, where you have few reflections, little reverberation, or whether it's in a forest where there are lots of reflections, the sound just bounces around, you still have to be able to, to localize and tell the distance and pick out the cues there. And we, we know a lot of, um, uh, from psychoacoustic research, what those cues are. But, and here's the important thing, as, as species, you have to be able uh, to do that in the different situations, in different environments, 
and sort it out, and then basically you can ignore the environment. And I think this is what is happening also in, in today in a, in a living room, where you have the direct sound that you use to create this illusion, but you have also the reflections. Now, the reflections don't tell you anything new if they have the same spectral content like the direct sound. That's, that's a very important point. If the spectral content is the same, then it is like, oh, reflection from there, or it's just a copy of, of what I heard coming from here, from the direct sound, but it's from there. It's just copies, copies. They're delayed copies. And we actually use them to in, increase intelligibility. There's also research has been done there that you have to have a certain amount of reflection in, like in rooms, like in, in uh, 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 lecture rooms or so, to improve intelligibility. So the idea that, that you often read about uh, is that, well, you don't want reflection, you want to have absorbers, everything should be as dead as possible. That will make, give you the most accurate sound reproduction? No because you're not counting for what is happening between the ears there, which has evolved over, out of necessity over, I don't know, millions of years probably, yeah, long time. Now, a lot of this here has been studied, and you have heard the terms like the, the precedence effect, the precedence effect in a room in particular. Uh, we know that uh, uh, if you have a direct and reflected sound, they are heard as a single ed entity from the location of the direct sound. The Haas effect, very well known. The integration of a direct sound with a delayed sound to add loudness. I mean, this is very much exploited in, in many rooms and halls and concert halls, churches. Uh, and an effect, which is also part of the precedence effect, uh, de-reverberation, at least I hadn't seen much about this, but this effect is that we are normally not much aware of reverberated sound, even when its energy is larger than that of the direct sound. The picture that I showed you earlier, the uh, direct sound in all the reflections, where the energy in all these reflections, because they don't decay, decay immediately, the energy in there is bigger than what is in the direct sound. Yet, it doesn't necessarily disturb us. So, oops, uh oh, I pushed the wrong button, and let me let me find here back where we were. Okay, the precedence effect. Oh, and there is. Uh, uh, I think we also need to add another model that, that also relates is Günther Theil's association model. Don't know if you have